my name is Wade Crowfoot, and I am uh, incredibly lucky to lead the California Natural Resources Agency. Um, this is the second uh, edition of what we're calling the Secretary Speaker Series. And the idea is uh, to spend uh, an hour once every couple months uh, bringing in external big thinkers uh, to our agency to really elevate concepts or priorities that we want to work a lot more on within government uh, in the agency. First, uh, raise your hand if you came to the first uh, event. All right, a few of you. Well, some of you. All right, repeat customers. Uh, the first event was on multi-benefit floodplains. So we're really looking at how can we uh, uh, protect communities from flood risks while benefiting the environment. Um, and then obviously today we're talking about a really exciting uh, topic with a, a bunch of uh, different thought leaders. Uh, let me just say that if you are interested in suggesting other uh, concepts or speakers to come in, uh, we're very open. Uh, uh, discussing any manner of, uh, of things. We could do in-depth interviews with big thinkers or even do things like screening movies or, or programs. Uh, Lizzie Williamson, who we have for organizing this event, Kevin Hutting, is your person if you have uh, any great ideas. Um, let me just give a, just a quick survey in terms of so we have a sense of who's in the room. Um, raise your hand if you work at the Natural Resources Agency. All right. A lot of you. That's great. Uh, raise your hand if you work for another state agency. All right, great. Raise your hand if you work for a federal agency. Jen Rasmussen here is from the Bureau of Land Management, and we're thankful for partnership with the BLM, uh, particularly on this Biodiversity Council over the last several years. Raise your hand if you're from a local government. All right. Uh, the few, the proud. Um, the uh, non-governmental organization, NGO. Excellent. Academia? Uh, tribal leadership? Excellent. What other categories have I missed? <laughs> All right, truck drivers. All right, good. So listen, now we're gonna we're gonna um, the way I, t I talk about the, what we're gonna talk about today is, um, you know, scientists educate us that there are two crises facing our planet. Uh, the first is climate change, and we obviously spend a lot of time thinking and talking and acting on climate change. Um, the second crisis, much less discussed, is this trend of mass ex mass extinction um, that we're ser that we're experiencing on this planet, where every day. Uh, across our world, we lose uh, types of plants and animals forever. Uh, and that's something that we started to talk about in the last administration under the leadership of Governor Brown, but it hasn't really uh, been a central discussion uh, within state government, and we're excited to change that. So today we want to talk about both sort of the concept writ large, um, what's happening on the ground with local leadership, um, and what our thought partners uh, have done uh, to date with the state on the topic of biodiversity. So. We're going to start off with a uh, with somewhat inspirational video, or something that I found inspirational, and just putting this in planetary scope. Um, then, we'll, then we'll ask uh, one of our colleagues to talk about biodiversity in California. We'll bring up a panel of leaders um, that bring different perspectives. And then lastly, we'll talk about um, the role that citizen science plays in this movement, and something that we can actually all do as, as soon as this weekend. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, roll the uh, video. Biodiversity is a term that represents the total variety of all life on Earth. That's a big thing to sum up. Thousands of different wild habitats, millions of different species, billions of different individuals, and the trillions of different characteristics they all have. The total biodiversity of our planet is immense. Which is a good thing, because the more biodiversity, the more secure all life on Earth is, including ourselves. Only when life is at its most varied, vigorous, biodiverse, can we hope to thrive. We may not know it, but we need towering forests across one third of the land surface to lock away carbon and keep the climate stable. We need millions of pollinators and billions of soil organisms and megatons of plankton to keep the food we eat in supply. We need strange plants deep in jungles to create our medicines and coral reefs and mangrove swamps to protect the coasts we depend upon. Our planet's biodiversity provides all the things we need for free but it will only do so if there's lots of it, and at the moment, it's under attack. 
In the last 50 years, our activities have dramatically reduced biodiversity across the globe. We've snuffed out habitats, reduced populations of wild animals by 60%, and even driven whole species extinct. The number of lions in Africa has dropped by 65%. The number of individual flying insects in Europe has dropped by 75%. The number of bluefin tuna in the Pacific has dropped by 95%. Biodiversity is dropping everywhere and fast. This is catastrophic for nature and therefore ourselves. We talk about climate change a lot, but biodiversity loss is as important an issue. How do we stop this loss of life? How do we ensure that biodiversity, our planet's vital statistic, begins to increase again? In fact, we already know exactly what to do. So what do we do? Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, that, uh, I think, provides some planetary context and, and some inspiration in terms of what we're trying to protect collectively. But we obviously want to focus um, the conversation on what biodiversity means uh, for California and how we can actually lead the world um, protecting species, uh, much like we're leading the world reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I want to introduce Kevin Hunting. Kevin Hunting served for a very long time at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, ended his career there as Chief Deputy Director. He went into retirement, minding his own business. We recruited him back um, as a retired annuitant to help uh, advise us uh, on, on what we can be doing on biodiversity. So the question I'd, I'd uh, ask you, uh, Kevin, as you start a short uh, update on, on biodiversity in our state is, you know, we saw a lot of exotic species from African lions to, wha you know, to, to whales in the Arctic uh, to uh, any manner of organisms outside of California. Why does this matter to us in California and what is the state of our biodiversity? The right questions, Wade. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me back out of retirement as well to do things I really still care very much about. So inspiring video, a little concerning. Uh, and uh, I, my job here today is to really kind of set the context for this, uh, what I consider to be a stellar panel of, uh, of thought leaders on the, con on the topic of biodiversity. So um, as, as, as I'm sure many of you know, California is a uh, one of the most diverse, if I can get this to, there we go. California is one of the, has the most biodiversity of any state in the United States. In fact, it's a global hotspot for biodiversity in the nation. You can see from this slide here, which is kind of a measure of uh, biodiversity through the lens of species richness or the number of species in a given area and rarity, the number of rare species. So combine that, the number of rare species with a number of species overall in a given area, and in this case, the United States, this is what you see. So biodiversity is California, and in fact, it's really, a, it is our natural heritage. Much as the arts and literature are the, our cultural heritage, the exceptional biodiversity in California is our natural heritage. It's worth protecting and it's worth conserving. Uh, these next couple of slides, I'm gonna, the, some graphics up here that just kind of illustrate this generally. This is a slide of plant, plant riches, the number of plants uh, in the ecological regions throughout California, really exceptional when it comes to the US and, and California. Uh, this is one of uh, bird species richness, and uh, you know we have about 450 native species of birds in California. Hundreds and thousands more migrate through of different species migrate through California each year, making it really one of the most unique places on Earth for that kind of biodiversity. We're also the most populous state in the United States. And as you heard on the, in the video, uh, a lot of those threats and the concerns that you saw are also playing out here in California. Habitat loss and fragmentation is the number one global and California threat to biodiversity. Invasive species, depressed native species populations, and um, can lead to extinctions. Climate change, of course, is the, probably the most existential threat we have to the future of biodiversity in California and across the globe. And then you heard in the video, species extinctions. So 
That's happening here too. This is not unique uh, to other places on the planet. Um, but through all that, you know, what are we doing here in California? What is it that we're doing to prevent extinctions and to conserve the diversity of life in California? Uh, we've got a ways to go. Uh, actually, we have a long ways to go. You'll hear this from some of the panelists, but we are, you know, California is acting and is a leader in many ways. Uh, a large part of our land base is currently under some level of protection. You think of natural, national forests, national parks, state parks, ecological reserves, wildlife areas. Uh, they all have varying degrees of protection, but all of those protected areas, and you'll, you'll hear more about this from our speakers, contribute to the protection of biodiversity. Um, we're a leader in California environmental policy and, and programs. Uh, I don't think there's any other state in the United States or maybe any other country that's kind of taken the lead on environmental and wildlife policy that California has uh, with varying degrees of success. We have conservation planning programs that have resulted in over a million acres on the ground being protected uh, perpetually. And um, through the Regional Conservation Investment Strategy Program, we have a vehicle now to kind of measure and document baseline biodiversity throughout the state. So there's been a lot of good progress in that arena. Partnerships for conservation, um, everybody in this room I'm sure is familiar with the partnerships the state has established that local governments have uh, initiated and in partner with the state on. Regional partnerships like the Habitat Joint Ventures all contribute to uh, increasing our knowledge of biodiversity and the protection of biodiversity in California. Uh, technological innovations, pr exciting stuff. Uh, that I'm, I'm pretty excited over my career to see the advances here. Uh, you know, now we can remotely sense or remotely document and observe uh, species and habitats and uh, environmental parameters like we never could before. Uh, that opens up a whole new kind of door to establishing baseline information about a lot of the species in California. Conservation genomics, uh, exciting kind of cutting edge genetic uh, basis for um, describing species and the variety among species. So we have a lot going on here in California. Um, I think we have a moment in time to do something. Uh, in, biodiversity awareness is increasing. It's still, um, it's, it, there's room for improvement, but it, people are aware that biodiversity conservation is an issue. And th it's really a moment in time for us to do something about that. And I think we can. I think there's, there's plenty that we can do. So I want to thank Secretary Crowfoot for making this a priority and thank the panel for attending today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Kevin. So, so last year, Governor Brown actually issued a, an executive order um, on biodiversity, really calling for the development of a roadmap on biodiversity, and also uh, called for uh, the first annual California Biodiversity Day, uh, which is actually occurs for a second time uh, this Saturday. Um, that effort was supported by uh, a bunch of groups and leaders outside of government. One of those was Dan Glusenkamp, the executive director of the California Native Plant Society. So Dan, if you can come up and, and let us know sort of what the state of the, the, state of the effort is uh, as it relates to the work of leaders and groups outside of government with state government. Okay, sounds good. Am I on? Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, before I get started, I wanted to focus on that, that first bullet of Kevin's slide and just acknowledge the success story that that represents, that we've saved half of our land. By save, that doesn't mean that it's locked up as public land that can't be used for, by ranchers. It means that it has status that allows it to conserve biodiversity. That's part of the half earth thing. And as a result, we've been faring pretty well in the face of the extinction crisis, even as we've developed our state. And that California success story is something really remarkable that I think we need to talk about more. And I'm just honored to be here in this room, in this building, that housed the people who largely made that possible. The folks in this building over the last several decades have killed themselves to save California. And I just want to say thank you for that. So thank you. And uh, keep going. Hire more people and get them to work. OK, so, so a little bit about the history of how this thing has evolved. And then, um, and then a little bit about where I see some of the areas that I could see it going in the future. 
So this thing, the California Biodiversity Initiative started about two years ago when Governor Brown asked a couple dozen scientists to consider putting together a charter for protection of native plants and biodiversity. We fought it out and put together what I think is a pretty good charter. There's some copies at the back if you haven't seen it. Um, it sets a vision for how Californians can work together to grow our state, grow our economy, and save the foundations of that prosperity. The charter inspired additional work. Governor Brown declared about a year ago, this Saturday, declared a California Biodiversity Initiative. And he issued a, an executive order that um, directed all state agencies to work on this and the resources and ag agencies to be co-leads on this. That was part of um, issuing a roadmap that was developed by the group of scientists providing input and Chuck Bonham providing a whole lot of elbow grease to give us kind of a 30,000 foot overview of how we can come together to save California even as we build a new California. So that all started in the last administration. There's been a lot of action in this current administration. It was started by Brown, but Newsom's administration has really grabbed it and run with it. And in the time since, there's been allocation of resources towards moving this initiative forward. Folks have been having conversations and partnerships have been building, and we've been kind of bringing this team together and including more and more people in the conversation about what we all can do to save California biodiversity. And I'm gonna talk about some ideas, but we're just getting started on figuring it out. Well, we're not, because actually, it's all kind of off the shelf. We've done most of it for years as pilot experiments, I think, and now we need to bring them together and actually, uh, and actually kind of make it part of what California is about. Um, the, the, and so, as this thing has moved forward, part of the discussion has been kind of identifying a sort of a broad plan. And so I'm gonna lay out my idea of that broad plan. Um, thus far, no one said that it's a terrible idea, and, um, and, uh, and, and so it's what I'm working on personally as part of the California Native Plant Society, and we'll see how far along we get it. And it really consists of two tiers. Um, the, the three tiers, three tiers of the plan include um, doing what California has always done, fight to save California. So tier number one, we save California's biodiversity. And we do this in a, a variety of ways I'll get into. Tier two is we take that California success story and we use it to inspire the nation and inspire the world to take it on and to, and, and to take action to save their biodiversity. And then tier three is even more aspirational. We change culture, we change society, and we all wind up on a planet that is working to save biodiversity. And this is something that, this is kind of the California plan, A. You know, we've done it a number of times. Act in California, inspire the nation and the world, and change culture. And we've done it recently with climate change. And I think we can take some of that same rule book and, um, and apply it to this issue. And it's a great opportunity for it. So within tier one, there's a whole lot of things that we need to do. I encourage you to check out the roadmap. There's some very good ideas in there. And I encourage you to get involved in the ongoing conversations to make sure that your ideas are represented as we plan to go forward. But fundamentally, in order to do good work, we need to know what we have. We need to understand California's biodiversity. And it's a little bit scandalous that we don't yet have everything mapped. We don't know how many butterflies we have in California. We don't know where all of our rare plants are. We have a long way to go. So we need to figure that out. And basically, you know, you can think about it. When someone's developing a shopping mall, shopping mall or putting in you know, solar development, you need to map the site to see what sensitive resources are gonna be impacted so you can avoid them. We're not building that, we're building a new state. We're building a state that is 100% renewable, that tends our natural areas to sequester carbon so that we don't choke ourselves to death, that has safe access to cleaning water and good water systems, transportation systems, new housing developments. We're building a new state that looks very different on the ground and in the people than the state that we have today. And it's time for us to do a survey of California biodiversity to see what we have, see where it is, and then make the right decisions as we build this wonderful new state that the rest of the world will be jealous about and pay to come visit on their vacations. And so, you know, one inspiration for that is chronicled in Up and Down California. It was a journal, set of letters written by a guy, some young college grad whose first gig out of college was to map the biodiversity of California in the early 1860s. McKinley put him up to it. They named a mountain after the guy as a result. It's an incredible book, an incredible look at California before all of this happened. And I think it's an inspiration for the kind of thing that we can do going forward. Not just to figure out what we have, but to create opportunities to bring new people into this work, to let new people share in the exploration and the joy and the satisfaction of doing it. 
And so I'm putting a plug in for that. I also think that one of the things that we can do is to um, declare California a no extinction state. And that's a little bit cheating because we're, we're doing pretty good on that already. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do to save California in tier one. The important thing is that we do them and that we talk about the success stories so that we can accomplish tier two. And that's inspire the nation and the world. In tier two, we can do a lot of different ways. Just by being here in California, we seem to do it. Chuck Bonham's laid out a vision for tying it in to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, a treaty that's signed by every UN nation in the world except for one, um, that sets clear goals for the year 2020. We have until October 2020 to meet those targets. Um, and that gives us kind of a timeline for, it you know, gives us a framework and a timeline for working on that stuff and bringing it to a global stage where all the nations in the world and all the peoples of the world can, can take a stand on this. And then tier three is even more aspirational, and that is that we change the culture, that we, we do what we did with wetlands, um, from where they went to being you know, a, a wet spot they filled with trash to being something that we protect. And that's a cultural change that is happening, whether we all see it or not. People are concerned about biodiversity, no matter what word they use, and we have an opportunity to bring biodiversity into the toolbox the way clean air, clean water, and other values are. Um, so that's some of what I see our possibility. I think I'm probably out of time. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Okay. So Professor Erica Zavaleta uh, teaches uh, ecosystems and evolutionary biology at UC Santa Cruz. Raise your hand if you're a banana slug. Anybody? All right, a few of you. Um, she literally wrote the book on ecosystems in California. So Professor Zavaleta, could you come up and, and share what your vision is in terms of the art of the possible on saving biodiversity in California? Great, thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Okay, uh, I need to find that clicker. All right, I may not stay behind the podium. So thanks so much. It's really an honor to be part of this conversation and um, it's really exciting to hear how much we're all thinking along the same lines going forward here. Um, I also want to say that much of what I've learned about California's ecosystems was from putting together that book. And just to acknowledge that I didn't write it, right? Like 180 people wrote it. Some of you are here in the room, so thank you. Um, and I want to express my gratitude to that community and also to the New Senate and the First Peoples of this place. So with just 3% of US land area, California is home to more than a third of the continent's indigenous languages and to about a third, oops, I'm gonna stay there, of all of the known biodiversity in the United States, all of our single state endemics in the US and the US's threatened species. So, it's better if I stay back here. Um, biological diversity and human diversity have always gone hand in hand in California, and that should be even more so going forward because today California is also the most diverse state in human terms in the US. And although we have a lot of at-risk species, we've kept most of what we have. So we've lost less than one tenth of 1% um, of California's globally unique species. About 32 species that we know of have gone extinct. So we have most of what we started with and what we do in the coming decades will shape the fate of those remaining species. Now the big physical threats to California's biological diversity have long been habitat loss and invasive species primarily. So most of those known extinctions to date have been because of one of those two things. And if you look at this, this is cumulative known extinctions of California endemics since 1800. And you can see this flattening out at the end here. This is so exciting because this means that through lots of good work, including by the people in this agency, in the last 50 years, we've really, really held back, stemmed the tide on many of these physical threats. And that's dramatically slowed irreversible losses. And in this period where there's only been one known extinction, the population of California has more than tripled. Our economy has grown tremendously and generated a lot of wealth. And our air and water have actually gotten a lot cleaner. We've even reintroduced species to the wild during this period, like the California condor, that were previously only able to exist in captivity for decades. So we're building on successes with this work. And, um, you know, that building on successes, now we're facing this bigger challenge, which is a societal threat to biological diversity in the state. And that is the disconnection from nature of California's residents, because ultimately they are the constituency for conservation here. So a key part of our work is to renew appreciation for the biodiversity's place in our identities and our cultures and our well being. And we have constituencies for biodiversity, but they need to grow and connect. We need a model for the world 
not just the work we can do in scientific and professional conservation circles, but also the work to bridge and to unify awareness by teaching and also by listening and by sharing leadership um, in these efforts so that we can cement biodiversity as a core part of who we are and what we rely on in this state. So we need more of things like this through our schools and public universities and with tribes and community organizations so that we are preparing the diverse next generation of this effort's leaders and its supporters. Now, how could California's ecosystems be if we succeed? The biodiversity roadmap set goals that embody the answer. So this is already part of California's policy. We should absolutely keep all of the parts that we still have. No other state or nation has committed to this meaningfully, but we can do it. We should also be hurtling towards these goals to protect and restore, which are also a core part of the Convention on Biological Diversity Goals, but we can do them better. We can do them for every ecosystem type. It'll be harder for some, like the state's wetlands. We're down to below a tenth of what we started with. It'll be easier for others, like the alpine. And we should do it not just as postage stamps, but in meaningfully connected, buffered ways at landscape scale so that they are resilient to change. Finally, um, we can continue on the path of recovering from past damage. The low point for California's environment was actually in the 1960s. And so we can continue on the path of moving away from that by re-expanding ecosystems and species to their original extents and renewing their roles in sustaining the systems that support both wildlife and people. On the international stage, we can take stories of our progress and commitments to at least three major venues in the next year. Um, the first, Dan just talked about at the Convention on Biological Diversity. So what he said. The second, uh, the World Conservation Congress, the largest conservation gathering in the world. It's a cross-sector gathering, and it's an opportunity to showcase how we work in inclusive, collaborative, cross-sector partnerships to achieve this culture change. And then the third, the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity, or I'm sorry, the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is the UN body that issued that very grim report last year about a million species that could go extinct, is now entering phase two, and it's producing a transformative change roadmap for the world to avoid those losses. And California's work belongs squarely at the center of that strategy. So California can, I believe, lead the world out of this biodiversity crisis, and we can do that with the core principles of our charter, science, inclusion, and collaboration. We can keep all the parts and more, I am convinced, if we really involve everyone. Thanks. Thanks so much, Erica, and I, and I love the connection um, with our human diversity in California, which I feel like we celebrate on a daily basis with our natural diversity and the linkage uh, between the two and the necessary linkage between the two. Um, from my perspective, while a lot of the work uh, gets done in government and policy and funding, ultimately saving biodiversity manifests on the ground um, where we're actually working across California to protect habitats and protect species. Um, so we have Bree Fraley here, uh, who's the Chief Governance Officer of the Tuala Dene Nation, to talk about the work that you uh, and, and, your, yeah, uh, and your tribe and local leaders have led actually making a difference and sort of manifesting some of the work we're talking about here today. Right. Thank you so much for introducing me. Um, it's quite a panel to have to follow after this. I, um, a little bit, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm getting back in the saddle. I have four young boys. I just want to say that, um, <clears throat> am I up yet? That I'm a, I'm a user of the biodiversity here. And so what I want to talk about is setting the stage. Um, I have a lot of connecting points from the, the previous presenters here in regards to the diversity of California being equitable to the diversity of the indigenous peoples of California. So when we talk about California being the most biodiverse in the United States, it's also the most diverse in indigenous peoples. And so that goes into my end platform, which I have um, been known on the Fish and Game Commission track as um, my tag name is of co-management. And this is going to speak to the reason as to why uh, Talawadini Nation and other First Nations within California believe in the sentiment of co-management. Because if you look at this map here, there's 
the diversity is equitable to the biodiversity and we cannot manage um, the state of California and its uniqueness and um, from you know this Oregon border to the to Baja with one blanket policy, it has to be done uh, boots on the ground level. It has to be done from a regional approach. Um, myself and others have been advocating at the commission level, sitting with the previous Secretary of Natural Resources, now going to the governor to talk about the importance of co-management at the policy level. So. Um, I myself am a user of the biodiversity. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm, a, I'm an advocate and I'm a steward of these resources. And I have an integral relationship with these things. And I want to um, talk about some of the things of how it hurts me as a person. So talking about it at the, on the humanistic side of things to look at the loss of um, the biodiversity that we're talking about and the loss of culture, the loss of language and those other things for First Nations and indigenous peoples within the state of California. Um, for my tribe, there's only one fluent speaker left of our language. When that person passes on, there probably will be no more speakers, just as equitable to what we're talking about here today in, the, in regards to biodiversity. And for us, those two things go hand in hand. For example, today I'm wearing something very significant, and probably most of you re resource staff are aware of um, the regalia I'm wearing today as the red abalone, or in my language, the shakwashti. And um, it is an endangered species that's been a hot topic um, you know, at the commission level, the department level, scrambling to look at um, protections, restrictions of take. What kind of impacts does that have to my community and my people? I don't have access to these resources. I can't practice my ceremonies and culture. So there's a equitable decline of loss for culture and that uniqueness. And we all are going into that melting pot of just mainstream California if we if we don't do something about it. So for us as First Nations people, maintaining the biodiversity of California is of the utmost importance to us and priority because we cannot sustain our culture without it. So um, I, I come from a mixed household. Um, I'll just talk a little bit more about Talo Adani Nation in regards to um, this more regionalized approach to uh, management. So for us, um, a port, a third, bottom third of our portions, uh, Aboriginal territories in California, a majority of it's in Oregon, but the way that we're structured is we have 12 yash -e or districts within our uh, consensus, our group of people of Talawa people, and it was managed at that micro level of those 12 districts within what's equitable to Del Norte County in Northern California today. So you're just getting into the weeds of things of the management, the resource management, and how things were cared for at that small community level. So, um, you know, I, I asked leaders in the room, I asked Chuck, I asked Secretary Crowfoot, how are you going to work with us at the local level as tribes to be the first stewards and to let us exercise our sovereign rights in regards to stewardship? Because when we get to exercise our sovereign rights, you all benefit. You guys all benefit because we want what's best for, for our ecosystem because we were put here with that responsibility to do so. So for us, in our creation story, in our beginning, it talks about the first redwood tree coming up, um, which is now at Yontaka at the state park. It talks about the waves coming over. It talks about humans and their responsibility to give thanks. So. Um, I come from a world renewal people. It is our responsibility to care for the earth and fix the earth and do those things. And when the earth is hurting, our communities are hurting. So going back to me being of a mixed um, tribally cultural family, my husband is Yurok and I'm Talwa. And so if you guys know anything about tribal dynamics, that's an interesting house to live in because those are two warring tribes and politically we don't get along. Um, so but my uh, husband works in the environmental program at the Yurok tribe. And so I like to talk about the conversations that we have around the dinner table with our children because I want them to hear what is going on in our work. I want them to, I, I've chosen to live um, where I'm from because I can't, um, 
in my personal opinion, I can't be Tolowa without living in that location because I have a relationship with that place. I go out and gather the acorns. I go out and gather the seaweed. We do our ceremonies there, and I can't be that person if I don't have the resources. And so we're intertwined and we're inseparable. So for the Yurok tribe, a couple of years ago, um, it's been several years ago now, but with the fish kill and then the fish closer, closures on the Klamath River, they were facing a challenge of their cultural identity, of who are we if we're not Nepui people, if we're not Nur'er if we're not Pulikla, if we're not river people fishing on the river, what do we have left? What is our identity? What do we do? And so I think that's applicable to all indigenous peoples within the state of California. If we don't have those resources that are thriving and diverse, then how do we um, ignite those cultural practices? And so for us, it's a, a painful thing to watch and experience. And we have solutions that we're offering to the state. Um, and I just want to acknowledge um, Chuck's work. I've had an interesting relationship with him for the past <laughs> several years. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about this, and I'll close it out. And uh, I'll just put this last slide up, because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a local artwork that uh, I, I admire in regards to um, the people of Northern California, the Kruk people, the Weop people, the Hoopa people, um, the Talawa Dene people, um, the Wailaki people. All those people are my people, and um, I, I hope that I can represent them well today in regards to talking about um, what we have to offer the state. Um, so several years ago, we made this uh, push out of the Executive Order B-1011 for tribal consultation. And I remember um, very vividly, uh, I don't want to say arguing with Chuck, but you know, he's like, well, how are we going to do this? We have over 100 federally recognized tribes. You want us to consult with each one of you? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, but it's no different than the diversity of California, the biodiversity of California, and what you guys are talking about today, and the initiatives and the challenges and everything that you guys are working on together. Um, if you take care of us, if you work with us, those things are going to be maintained, and it's going to be a great partnership. So I guess my challenge to um, most of the people in the room who are uh, under secretary, the secretary's um, watch is to challenge you to move outside of your scientific policy box and to look at innovative, creative ways for partnership and to maybe let go of some of that control and um, look at ways that we can work on changing policy and law at the state level to work on coming up with creative agreements and allow for sovereign nations to partner with the state of California. So thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. So we're going we're gonna to ask actually the three uh, leaders who have just spoke to actually come up uh, as we bring up the screen uh, and, and join us for a, a short panel. I'm going to ask at least one or two questions and then open it up to uh, our audience here today. I'm also pleased to let you know that, that we're live streaming this, thanks to our incredible AV staff here at the agency. Uh, and if the last speaker series was any indication, actually we have folks watching this uh, from all over the state. And of course, this is also recorded, so you can share with others. So why don't we have our, our, our three speakers come up. First question I wanted to ask is, you know, the Endangered Species Act is, is very much in the news uh, right now, given President Trump attack on the Endangered Species Act. We have a California Endangered Species Act. A lot of us sort of that haven't been as in-depthly immersed in biodiversity as you are have thought the sort of Endangered Species Act is an adequate fail-safe. In other words, when a species gets threatened, a bunch of protective laws come in place and save that species. So the first question I put out there is, why isn't the Endangered Species Act enough? Okay. <laughs> problem with waiting until it's so late in the game is that you end up hitting the, uh, the, the needs and the wants of a small number of people typically against the needs of a species once it's already so rare that you have to sort of dive in and 
prevent all sorts of things from happening um, in order to protect it. Whereas if you sort of are able to step back and, and look at biodiversity sort of earlier on before it's already sort of tanking, um, then you can focus more on the work that benefits both the wildlife, the biodiversity, and the people connected to those same places. So thank you. <laughs> I thought I turned it on. Um, so I think the biggest problem with it is that you move from a sort of win-win kind of operating framework if you wait till so late in the game to a really zero-sum kind of operating framework. And I think that's been a lot of the source of the polarization around biodiversity in US politics. That's great. So let me ask a question maybe to, to Bree. Um, you know, we've often also traditionally thought about um, protecting biodiversity through rules and laws and control. Um, so, you know, a lot of departments in our agency are stewards of, of the land and and we've done that traditionally by setting up rules and maintaining control as the state. I think you um, demonstrate or, or articulate a really important paradigm that there are peoples in California that have been taking care of the biodiversity for millennia. And it's really about empowering um, you know, those stewards uh, to, to protect biodiversity. I guess maybe talk a little bit about more, more uh, about what it looks like for the state or the federal government to step back and cede some control um, to, to tribal governments or local leaders. Uh, thank you, Wade, for our Secretary Crowfoot no, for Wade. asking that, yeah. that, that question. Um, I don't know how this guy keeps up over here. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, so thank you for ask, uh, asking that provocative question um, because it was an important thing that I wanted to talk about to you all earlier in the day, and it's... Um, something that my tribe, the Talawadini Nation, has been working on for a number of years, and it's through the development of our own tribal law within our own jurisdiction. So um, part of this co-management part was, well, you know, the question was posed from the state, do tribes have the, resource to man uh, the resources to manage these things? And we said, yes, we do. And so we needed to demonstrate that we're just as equally responsible to the resource as the state by enacting our own laws and policies for protections. But we took a completely different approach um, in regards to how we did that. In regards, what we did was we um, established some traditional ecological knowledge policies and we conducted extensive um, interviews with our elders and people that are cultural bearers. And then we went through an iterative process with uh, tribal committees, the tribal council, and the, communi and the community, and created tribal laws that were uh, specific to the resource that were um, based on traditional law and practice, and then how we were going to implement them. Some of the pitfalls and why Talawadini Nation is asking for co-management is those laws only apply to our people. If you, if I encourage you guys all to pick up, pick up, you know, Federal Indian Law 101, the diversity of Public Law 280, for all those other reasons, our jurisdiction only lies within. I wish Nathan Vogley was here today. Our um, our jurisdiction only lies within our reservation boundaries, and so that's part of what our issue is, is that we can, and we can only apply it to our people and the, pe the people that consent to it. And so part of the issue is, is why would we create this law for myself? Here, I'm a user, I'm Talwa, and now I have to apply, uh, comply with Talwa Day Nation, Day Nation law and California state law and I have to go through all these other hoops hmm. when one law might be more applicable and practical to the resources within the region. So we, when we talk about laws, uh, fish and game code and regulations, it's mostly about the take of things, not re re necessarily the management of things. And the way that we incorporated the tribal law was how you stewarded and took care of those things in regards to the take. And so we incorporated those things into the tribal law. And what we really want to do is to have that law applicable outside of the reservation boundaries. And we want to figure out a way for those things to be honored by non-tribal members. And so right now, it's mostly an educational endeavor on the tribe's behalf to educate users of the system, the biodiverse system within our region on how to walk across the landscape and how to respect it. And mm. that's about all we can do at this point because we can't enforce tribal law on non-tribal citizens. 
That's really helpful to understand. And my own sense is that there is a growing awakening around the importance of tribal or um, traditional environmental knowledge on actually managing landscapes. So one of my colleagues is here, Jennifer Montgomery, and she leads the Forest Management Task Force. And she's been actually in a lot of contact um, with tribal leaders, the Maidu, the Karuk, and others that have been engaged in traditional uh, uh, stewardship practices uh, to, uh, through prescribed burn and other uh, practices around healthy forests. Um, and so while it's obvious to tribal leaders, it's less obvious to people in government that we should really be looking to um, those stewards over millennia to actually inform the management, not only in those jurisdictions, but beyond. So let me ask you a tough question, Dan. All right. Um, we started out with that video, and we saw a lot of exotic uh, animals. Uh, in the environmental movement, it's called charismatic megafauna. If you ever get a uh, fundraising leaflet from an environmental group, you'll get have a picture of a wolf or a lion or a polar bear because people connect uh, with those. Yeah. The governor last week was in Los Angeles um, posing with a photo of P-22, which is the mountain lion, um, and in really the inspiration for uh, an overcrossing over 101 to keep uh, to maintain the health of the mountain lion population in Southern California. So that stuff motivates. Mm -hmm. um, the Butte County yellow star thistle or other plants, <laughs> yeah. uh, less so. And so the question is, um, and, I, and I ask it in a provocative way, but why should we care about plants? Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> how long do we have? Yeah. So, you know, plants, plants are the basis of all food chains on that, that we, that we're, plants are the basis of life in California. When we save plants, we save everything else. We save insects, we save the birds that feed on the insects. There's a lot of utilitarian reasons. They're very good chemists. They make all kinds of weird chemicals that we tend to find uses for. You know, we, part of what we need to do with the biodiversity initiative is we need to bring in all Californians and give everyone a chance to work on this. And you can do that with things like plants because all humans are basically pretty good botanists. Long time ago, there may have been some humans who couldn't ID a plant and they died of poisoning or starved to death. And you know, their <laughs> descendants are not around. Plants are absolutely <laughs> fundamental, but they're not the only thing. They're a great place to start. I think people, you know, those are all utilitarian reasons, but I think any time that someone sits down in front of a plant and looks at the flower or looks up at a redwood canopy or sits in a field of grass, something changes in them and they reconnect with kind of the fundamental hum of the universe. And I think when we get away, get away from excuses and rationalizations and utilitarian arguments, and we get away from the politics, I think fundamentally everyone wants to save living creatures. No one wants to drive them extinct. Mm. And I think everyone deserves a chance to be part of it. There's people in this room who have saved species from extinction. And that's got to be an incredible feeling. That's, I mean, you do anything else in your career, it doesn't matter. You've done that. And with a biodiversity hotspot, one of 35 on planet Earth, we've got enough species that many Californians can be involved in saving these things. We've got 2,500-ish rare plants. That's more plant species that are rare in California than there are plant species in most other states. Wow. And so we've got a lot of opportunity. Plants are a great place to start, but I want to plug, put a plug in for everything else all the way up to ecosystems. Excellent. And this is a really good segue to um, bringing up Scott in a moment to talk about citizen science and the role that we can all play. Um, but let me just ask you a final question, sort of a speed round in the panel. Um, if, and, th and none of these questions, of course, they had a question, uh, set of questions I was supposed to ask, and none of these questions I've asked were those questions. Because um, I think it's far more interesting to put you on the spot. Um, but if you, were, if, if you were governor of California uh, tomorrow, uh, or a benign dictator uh, in California, <laughs> there's a difference. Um, uh, what, what, what's, what's one thing you would, you would do as, as government? It can be as broad or as specific as possible, and any of you can jump in. Education. Education. <laughs> Build, fund, empower education on the importance of all this. Uh, and invest in the youth. Invest in the youth. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. I have four boys, and my goal is to hands-on, get rid of your cell phones, don't let them play video games. Okay make them be creative and have a relationship with the environment. And Good. like that last symbol, health of the people equals health of the environment. They need to have a relationship with it and get dirty and be out there. Excellent. I would agree with that, basically. I mean, I think that you know what I was saying earlier about the constituency for biodiversity needing to grow and connect in this state, I mean, that's where it's at, right? Like, that's who's going to decide who the government is 
going to be putting, you know, who's the governor next? It's it. The people of California, like they are connected to the landscape and to biodiversity by and large. We just don't talk about it. We don't talk about it at school. We don't talk about it in the public university system. So I would, I think, if I could do one thing that's kind of a long-range investment in California's biodiversity for the next century, it would be to make that a core part of the curriculum from K to graduate school and part of teacher training in the state because in the long run, no matter how much work we do on the science fronts, on the protection fronts, you know, if people don't understand why it matters and they don't feel connected to it, they're not going to care. Excellent point. Dan. Yeah, I would... So I reserve the right to come up with something better later. But at this point <laughs> yes. in time, I would, I would launch a survey of the biological diversity of California. And you can call it what you want, but that's the basic idea. And it brings in scientists. It brings in collections and museums. It brings in kids. It brings in satellites and people on the ground. Um, it gives us the data that we need to make smart plans. Make it specimen-based so that you're securing the specimens for the future, whether they want to pull the DNA out of them or just understand what life was like back in the 21st century. And do it in such a way that everyone is involved. So it's, you know, we use these metaphors like moon launch or Manhattan Project. And I don't know what metaphor to use, but World War II was an all-out mobilization that provided an incredible opportunity to folks who were not represented in American society. And America has changed for the better. And at this point in time, California is changing. And the majority of Californians are not college-educated white male scientists who kind of dominate biodiversity field too much at this point. They deserve the opportunity to be part of this. And expecting them to go through the college system and get a PhD and then get to work to contribute is too much. And, and we something, a well done biodiversity survey of California that really invests more money in the people and the and education and getting conservation corps and giving kids and grandparents the opportunity could do more than just save the biodiversity of California, but could be that transition to a unified state where everyone has the opportunity they deserve. Excellent. I just invite you to be seated again, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to stay afterward uh, for uh, questions uh, from folks who are here today. So let's bring up Scott Laurie, who's the co-director of the California Academy of Sciences. A lot of us have visited the Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. It's a remarkable institution. It's also a network of research scientists around California. Uh, but Scott's going to really talk about how regular people can connect uh, into the topic of biodiversity. Uh, great. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Uh, thanks so much. And I should pull this over. I can just stand out here, I guess. You can see me. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, so I, I co-direct iNaturalist, which is a joint initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and um, National Geographic. And my background is in, um, do I have slides up? Sorry. You need to, OK. I can just kind of, <laughs> I can see the slides. <laughs> um, <clears throat> My background is actually, OK, great. If you guys can see that, that back there, there we go. Well, it's, it's slowly coming up. So my background is in academia. And like so many of you in the, in the room trying to figure out what can we do to stop this, this extinction crisis, particularly the sort of land use climate crunch that, we're, that was unfolding before our eyes in the, these various decades. And I really stepped back from academia because I, I realized two of the big challenges is this issue of we just don't have enough data. You know, like this has been brought up many times with this um, with this panel. Is is uh, there's just not enough people involved. You know, a handful of museums, a handful of graduate students aren't going to be able to do the good work that's needed at the scale that we need to confront the challenge that we have over the next the next literally decade or two. Um, secondly, even if we had that information about what we wanted to do, people just don't care. Wade mentioned um, that you know this sort of a pull to the charismatic megafauna. You think of WWF; it's they get every they've done a fantastic job of getting everybody in the world to kind of care a little bit about the panda bear and sort of give a little bit of energy and, and acknowledgement and, and money to a very distant creature. But how do we get people to connect to the, the biodiversity in their backyard? I mean, people are sort of focused on these charismatic megafauna, whereas their 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 backyards, their landscapes, in many cases, landscapes that they have much more ability to control and get involved in are sort of unraveling or going completely off the radar. And it has, again, to do, this is brought up by Brie, with sort of tribal, you know, how do we get this sort of grassroots control? And um, I think government's fantastic, and as Dan was saying, all the good work that's been done in California by the government. But at the same time, there can create, as Eric was saying, sort of this friction between sort of the top down, you, you shall do this. How can we bring that grassroots um, momentum and scale? And these are the yeah, sort I would of. suggest that if we, bring up, if we bring up the screen, we've got a. Uh, a television right there. Let's just do that. Um, and then you can actually show the, uh, <laughs> you can show the images. 
great. So, so these were the, um, the uh, things that really sort of got me interested in citizen science because citizen science really does these two things, right? It creates data at scales that we haven't seen before. I mean, it really is true. Uh, it's only like 90% of the sort of biodiversity occurrence data coming out of the world right now is coming from citizen science data. So at this time, it is the engine of incredible scales of biodiversity. But also, it has the ability to democratize, to get more people engaged, to sort of connect people to do these things. My, um, so I was just gonna say my background, again, was looking at these sort of uh, academic crunches on, on things like plants in terms of climate change and, and, um, and land use change. Uh, ooh. Um, a little weird. <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of, um, so, then that's what led me into citizen science. But citizen science has been going on for hundreds of years, right, with the pencil and paper. So what are, what are we doing with iNaturalist? Well, it's really just using technology, which is another thing that California really leads in, is technology and trying to figure out how to get these systems working as a tool to scale this. We've seen a lot of good citizen science happening with birds because birds are, are manageable, they're very charismatic. But how do you get the same kind of enthusiasm to spread to things like plants and some of these underrepresented groups? And we found that technology is a, is a fantastic way to do that. It is very democratizing. Again, I think technology is a tool. We say we don't want our kids on you know, social networks just zo zoned in all day. But this is a very powerful tool that we all have in our pockets that has you know, the ability to, for anybody democratize the ability for anybody to participate and engage and connect and, co and create high quality data. So that's what iNaturalist is, the very sort of basic level. You take out your phone, you see a butterfly, you're sort of interested in it, you take a picture, um, you share that data point with a whole community of people around the world who can identify and help discuss and put that observation in context and teach you about it. And then that becomes a scientific data point that is, um, Dan said, is really the bread and butter of doing these sort of international surveys. And, and our philosophy behind this, again, is that what this starts with is someone making a personal connection to nature. You know, someone sort of holding a salamander in their hand or like John Muir kneeling next to a wildflower on a granite slab. And if we can get that personal connection with one person's, not the far off panda bear, but one person's critter in their backyard and build this movement off of that interaction, that's, that's what we're all about. Um, I just want to give one example. This is, this is something from last year which was kind of cool. Is there was a group of school kids off in Santa Barbara who saw this big ocean sunfish wash up on the beach and posted it to iNaturalist. And um, there is a common ocean sunfish here, but a bunch of biologists from Australia chimed in and said, this, ooh, this isn't the ocean sunfish you're thinking of. This is uh, something called the hoodwinker sunfish, which uh, you know, has never been seen in, in the Northern Hemisphere, never been seen in California. And there's this great back and forth. Well, if it really is a hood, hoodwinker, you gotta check the teeth and the tails, and you know, the school kids are opening the mouth. And this great interaction eventually looped in the person who actually has described the species and said, holy mola, you know, this is actually the hoodwinker. But this is the kind of back and forth, you know, democratic interaction that creates these discoveries. And while these are sort of charismatic discoveries, what's really exciting about this is the, um, it got picked up by a lot of, CNN has a, an unending appetite for sort of weird sea creature stories. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, what's great about, them, I don't know, okay, great. Um, what I think about this is like a pointillistic painting where every one of these interactions is intrinsically valuable for all this, personal connections and the great stories. But what we're trying to do is see if we can create a big data, sort of big synthesis, um, sort of like, like Dan was saying, global survey to try to understand how these things are changing. Um, and what I also love about this technology is we look at the scale of these challenges that we're confronting with um, climate change, land use change, everything, all the hockey stick curves we see of things going straight up. The one thing that we have with California that's doing a similar trajectory as this technology. It has the potential to scale and, and do big things in, you know, in a couple years. I'm not saying for good or for evil. That's, we'll get to that in a moment. But you know, there, this, these technologies have the potential to, do, to try new things. And I think a lot of times in, in conservation, we've just been trying the same things and sort of running into a wall. We have an opportunity with technology to, 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 to try something different. This is just the number of observations posted to iNaturalist that have been doubling every year. Um, there's sort of a summer bump because of the Northern Hemisphere bias. And I want to say, even though iNaturalist is now the, the largest citizen science site in the world, it's a California initiative. It started here in California. It's, it, California has the highest density of iNaturalist activity um, in, the, in the world, so it's, it's great. I just want to quickly say, you know, what do we want these data for? For a huge part of them is um, distributions, understanding how species are changing, where they are, when they are, how these things are changing over time. This is a little critter called the pica that I love. Um, 
we see things, you, you hear things like, oh, spring is getting earlier. We can actually see with our naturalist data now, this is a species called trout lily, is actually flowering significantly earlier than it did. And you can see that in the data. This isn't anecdotal. This is actually big analysis that are coming out of the contributions of, of, of millions of people. Um, this is something from a colleague I'll mention in a second, but um, uh, this is a, a, a nudibranch, was a little sea slug in the coastal area, the pink one there, which was not really known in Northern California. The orange one is one that was kind of common here. And all of a sudden, this, this nudibranch showed up out of nowhere. And citizen scientists were the people who saw this trajectory change. And this is really what we were talking about is, you know, the threats to California's biodiversity of these invasive species. This is how we catch invasive species early on. Uh, Eric was mentioning species that are going the other direction. We want to catch them before it's too late, but also before it gets too political. And if we can really generate this citizen science enthusiasm to sort of track these changes on a statewide picture for you know, hundreds of thousands of species, it's totally doable now. Um, we've also been doing a lot with image recognition. There's, uh, now with iNaturalist, you can sort of hover over any species and it will tell you what it is, which I think is kind of neat tech, but it's, um, it's just a huge part of the dem democratization of this stuff. You know, a huge bottleneck is uh, this knowledge is only within a handful of people in museums, but if we can get anybody involved to sort of be able to identify these species and play a part in monitoring and conserving these species, there's also neat applications in terms of detecting invasives, wildlife trafficking, things that are coming out of this. But then lastly, what I want to mention is that uh, the third kind of real goal of this is to get more people involved, to get to, to change the hearts and minds. And as I mentioned, iNaturalist is a tool, but to actually do this effectively, you need organization, community outreach. I wanted to acknowledge Allison Young, can you put your, your hand up, um, and Rebecca Johnson, who's not here. But my colleagues at California Academy of Sciences have been doing a tremendous amount of BioBlitz organization. How many of you guys know what a BioBlitz is? So there's actually getting kind of sort of just a lot of people to do iNaturalist at once to sort of go into a, a park or an area and really inventory. There's all the community building sort of stuff that happens. Um, Allison has been spearheading this thing called the City Nature Challenge, which started as a competition between LA and San Francisco and is now a global competition with hundreds of cities participating every year. Who's winning, LA or San Francisco? <laughs> Um, but this sort of, so it's a kind of bio blitz competition globally, and it really has an emphasis on, on urban biodiversity. Can we get underrepresented populations in urban areas to sort of take ownership of their, of their backyards? And has this great conservation aspect because urban biodiversity has a unique threats. Um, uh, this is the, the, last, the last year was these are the cities that participated globally. But again, this started in California. And so back to this idea of California really leading. I think with this technology, citizen science, we have an opportunity to, to pilot new things, to take things to the next level in California and serve it as an example for what could happen globally. Another one is um, Allison's initiative is called Snapshot Cal Coast. And this is getting people up and down the coast to sort of engage and sort of monitoring and figuring out what's going on with, um, with our coastal areas, like we mentioned, the abalone and the kelp, for the, to inform marine protected areas. And what, the only reason I wanted to mention these is that iNaturalist is just a tool, and I'm very honored to be able to, to stand up here and speak about it. But really, this tool is only useful if it's picked up by someone like Allison and sort of turned it, you know, used to organize people and to achieve certain goals. I wanted to mention this weekend, there's a um, sort of a pilot uh, a, a bio blitz that Lee Gardner has actually really been helping organize um, using iNaturalist, which will sort of be about nine parks around, around the state, sort of see what we can do to kind of get our feet wet. But, I also just wanted to bring attention to things like Snapshot Cal Coast and um, City Nature Challenge. These, these events take organization. They take sort of a lot of time, a lot of people really doing the outreach. iNaturalist is a tool. It's there. It's ready to use. We'd be fantastically excited to be involved, but it really takes the organization effort to, to get these things to happen. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, fascinating stuff. And the biggest challenge with, a, with an exciting topic like this is how to, how to cram a lot of exciting um, discussion into an hour. Um, so we got one last, um, one last person to finish this off. Um, I will just mention this bio blitz uh, that's happening this Saturday. Day. So you can park for you. Uh, by uh, so there's opportunity from a friend who works at State Parks up in Humboldt, uh, who's doing the bio blitz up there. Uh, a few times.
So who better to finish the Bob Church Day than Chuck? Oh, you got it right there. Great. I'm supposed to fire you up <laughs> and motivate you. I'm not sure you need it. But in that spirit, I want to achieve that purpose by going really quiet and silent for a minute. And because you're a captive audience, I ask you to close your eyes. Wade, seriously, close your eyes. <laughs> I'm doing it. Take a deep breath. And at a personal and emotional level, think about, have you ever waded in a river? Have you ever swum in the ocean or walked along the beach? Have you ever been outside and seen the sunset or the sunrise? Have you jumped in a lake? Have you gone fishing? Have you planted a plant? Props to Dan. Have you played in a city park? Are your people so connected to salmon and river, you don't know a past without them, and you can't see a future without them? Maybe most importantly, have you ever seen a smile break out on a young kid's face from ear to ear when they touch nature? Now open your eyes. Einstein said imagination may be more important than intellect. Imagine a world where all Californians have these kinds of experiences where all Californians connect with the kind of emotions you might have just surveyed in your own mind, where all Californians understand our sovereign partners have been doing balance and harmony since time immemorial. That California leads the world on biodiversity conservation. That's a world I want to live in. That's a world I think you want to live in. That's a world I think most of you have committed your professional careers to achieve. Look at the panel today. That's our future in so many forms. It's fresh voices. It's innovation. It's understanding who we are before most of us got here and how that's part of our future. It's about energy and excitement. These are really difficult times. Turn on the news. It's flat out depressing. So Barry Lopez wrote that when you put your hands in a river, you feel the cords that bind the earth. That's not about science. That's not about law. That's not all about policy. That's not about government. That's about interconnectedness. That's about interrelatedness. That's about religion. That's about your soul. That's about your spirit. I submit that's what biodiversity conservation really is about and has to become for 40 million people in California. So I think we're in the business of saving nature. There's a ton of reasons why that's a smart business to be in. It's smart for people. It's smart for our economy. It's about a sense of place. It's just right. It's just. When we succeed, and I've got no doubt we will, under the leadership of Secretary Crowfoot and Governor Newsom. Round of applause for Wade pulling the speaker series today. So the funny thing is, when we succeed at this and we save nature, we're actually going to discover that it's nature who's saving us. Hmm. So keep at it. We can do it. It's not going to be easy, but it's on our shoulders. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and working all together on this important priority. We hope to see you at the next series event.